Future contracts. This is one of the most widely and commonly used derivative contract uh, and the type of derivative, which is popular amongst all side and size and structure of the funds. It is very, very popular instrument in the financial market. It is also commonly used by different type of corporates to manage and minimize their um, foreign exchange risk and different type of risk exposure. So it is used in hedging also quite frequently. Hence, it is one of the uh, largest uh, trading derivative instrument uh, globally. Today, in this session, we are going to talk about the structure, use, accounting, pricing, and the different use cases of future contracts. So stay with me and we'll go through some very interesting and important aspect of uh, future contracts. And welcome to the session. My name is Nidhish Singh and I work for JP Morgan as JP Morgan as Vice President and Head of Transformation. I'm also a member of ACCA, Star Institute of Securities and Investment, uh, Institute of Director, and uh, I'm a, uh, holding a diploma in IFRS. So today we'll touch upon various aspects of future uh, and uh, we will also go through some of the calculations to clarify some of his complexities. So moving on, what is a future contract? Fundamentally, the definition of the future contract is that it is exchange traded. So it is one of those contract uh, and the derivative which is on the exchange and it is therefore standardized because when a contract or any derivative is on the exchange, it has a set structure because it is not OTC, it is not customized. It is following a, a set structure, which is on exchange. And it is also involving the margin because when it is on exchange, exchange take care of the counterparty risk. So it um, literally eliminates the counterparty risk. So there is a requirement to regularly post margin so that both sides are protected and exchange work as a watchdog between the two counterparty A and B. So uh, this is how it looks like. So with regard to margin and exchange, so if there is a counterparty A, and let's say counterparty B, There will be exchange this will become the in essence or in practice the other side of the contract so for counterparty a exchange will become the other counterparty and for con counterparty b the exchange will become the other side of counterparty. Hence, in this way, there is no risk to A or B with another counterparty because exchange is sitting there. This will take care of any kind of uh, default or counterparty risk. The counterparty risk is virtually the risk that the other side, who is a party of the contract, will not honor its obligation. That is counterparty risk. Hence, when exchange comes in the picture, that counterparty risk is eliminated. So what do exchange do then? What if exchange itself start to make loss? Hence, exchange try to protect itself by requiring each of the counterparty to deposit a margin with exchange. Because then exchange can, to a great degree, eliminate the counterparty risk. For itself. So in that way, all three parties are protected. So that is the meaning of counterparty risk and that's the uh, use of margin. Uh, we'll discuss this in more detail in the coming slides and the future contracts are traded on exchanges. So these three are uh, specific differences uh, uh, between future and forwards because forward is also very similar to future uh, with the exception of these three factors. 
like uh, it does not require margin, it does not require um, exchange, and also followers is an OTC or uh, the counter product, hence it is customized and, and not standard like a future contract. And the point to note is since future contracts are standardized, it is on exchange, it is regulated as well, it has higher degree of confidence in the market and amongst the counterparty. And because of this, it is much more liquid, frequently traded and used and relied upon. And uh, it has a larger volume as compared to forward. Many times uh, uh, students get, get confused that, oh, forward is flexible or the counter, it is customizable. Hence, that should be selling more. That should be more liquid and more popular. However, since future is standardized and on exchange, it has more confidence and trust. The fact that market is driven by confidence. And that's what the behavioral economics and behavioral finance suggest that um, market really pays a lot of premium on confidence. And that is why future is more popular as compared to forward, despite the fact that future is standardized. So let's see what are the other benefits or attributes of future. So the purpose of future contracts, hedging and speculating. So what are the two things? Let's go through a quick um, use case to understand this properly. Hedging. So imagine, um, let's take an example uh, and the business case. Imagine a farmer basically growing crops and it is month of March and farmer thinks that by June, the crops will be ready. Currently, the crop is selling at say $10 per bushel. That's the rate. And his or her fear is that in future when it is ready by June, the price may crash to say $7 only. And farmer does, obviously does not want that. What can he or she do? Let's take another example where the farmer will sell this. Farmer is going to sell this to a cereal maker or biscuit maker. Okay. So there will be a factory. And here is a gentleman who wants to buy this. He wants to buy the bushel from farmer and his fear is that in future by June end, when he needs bushel from farmer for various seasons, the price may go up. So he thinks that the price may shoot up to $12. Now, both of parties have their own fear and it may be genuine. It is their way of looking at the economics and the supply demand curve, et cetera. We'll not go into the details of economics, but th this is how the both party might see the same commodity from two different perspectives and hence may infer that the price can be a lot lower or, lo or a lot higher. Now, both of them want to fix the price of bushel at 10. So they want to get the uh, get something to guarantee that prevailing price of 10 will remain same even in June. What they should be doing? They will go into a future contract. And what does that say? Future contract will say that in June, farmer will sell maybe 100 bushel at the rate of $10. This is now written in stone. Both party signs and it is it goes on exchange. 
exchange will take care of the rest of the formality. Now, the, now come June, the price of bushel has gone up. It has become say 13. Now, the farmer, he is very sad because he realized that he could have sold the bushel at the rate of $13 and say $13, whereas the contract demands him to sell at 10. Well, he, he thought earlier that it can go down. So he went into this contract and he has to oblige by this contract. So he has to sell the bushel at the rate of $10 only, no matter what the market price is. But there can be opposite situation as well. This $13, this could be essentially even say eight, eight USD. What if it sells at eight? In that case, farmer will be very, very happy because he knows he has a contract to sell the 100 bushel to the industry at the rate of 10. And he can make $2 extra profit per bushel. In that case, the industry, the buyer here, he will be unhappy because he could have easily bought the entire bushel at eight and now he has to pay at 10. So he is making loss. In that way, we can easily see the future contract is a zero sum game. Like if one wins, another lose, another, and if he wins, the farmer loses. So ultimately, as a system, both party, their net gain or loss is zero. It is a zero sum game. So it looks like some, something like this. So farmer sitting here and then the industry, the business people sitting here. So it, it is like a seesaw whereby you, one side is down, another is up. If he goes down, he will be up. So that, that's the way future works. If one gains, another one loses and ultimately it will be zero if we add the gain or loss of both party together. So that's why it is a zero sum game. That is a working, working example of a future and it can be considered as one of the used case. Okay, so in this example, what was this all about? What the um, what the farmer and the industry and the business was trying to do? They were trying to hedge their market movement or any loss or gain because of this, because they both have concerns. Both wants to protect their business. And they want to lock the price. So that is called hedging. They want to hedge either their profit, the price, or the any market movement. They want to protect themselves from that. That's why it is called hedging, protecting. On the contrary, speculating is when one do not have any business to protect. There is no price movement to protect or any profit to protect. In case of a speculation, one just wants to make a pure profit. And in that sense, it is completely different from hedging. Here, one is trying to make profit. Whereas in this case, one was trying to just protect their business and the price. The pro profit was not the aim in hedging. Or in a speculation, one might feel that price of bushel is going up. So they will go into the contract thinking the price of bushel is going to move from 10 to 13. So they will go into the future contract to sign the bushel at the rate of 10. 
in which case if the price of bushel in reality goes down to 8 from 10 one party may just lose the money without having any business to protect they just want to speculate and make money eventually thinking that if the market goes up this this will be the long side which wants to buy the bushel and he thinks that oh it is going to go up at 13 why don't i just get the contract at 10 to buy but in fact the con the bushel price might go down and he will end up still paying ten dollar which is a loss so that is called speculating and that's the difference between the two So the purpose of the future contract. So again, uh, this is another use case whereby the there is a natural long and short party. So the worried pricey uh, party, which is for uh, thinking that the price will fall, it is selling a forward. component of uh, future contracts. So here we are talking about the different contracts, um, uh, di different underlying factors and the components of the future. So in this case, the future contract is underlying asset. It could be crops, gold. Because in the previous example, we noticed that eventually the crop is the underlying asset. We can write the future contract, but what will be the asset that we will be talking about? We'll, we, we can try to fix the price of the gold that, okay, uh, I want to buy one kg of gold at today's prevailing price. So gold here is the asset or underlying asset maybe. Mm -hmm. Underlying asset is gold. Since I want to freeze 10 gram price for the gold, so let's say today's prevailing price is 50,000 rupees per 10 gram of gold. So this is my price. Price is also fixed. When I want to buy that gold, and first of all, my position is long here. I am uh, into a long position because I want to buy. When I want to sell the gold to the counterparty, it will be called a short position. So here I'm along and the, the maturity or expiration date, I want to buy the gold, one, 10 gram or maybe one kg gold um, 90 days from now. So expiration will be 90 days from now. It could be 30th of June, something like this. And contract size. So fifth. So what will be the contract size? If I want to buy one kg of gold and the price that I'm talking about here is fixed for uh, each 10 gram. So I will have to have at least 100 contracts. So because I want to buy 1000 grams of gold, and the price that we are locking here is for each 10 gram. So I have to get 100 contracts. Okay. So 100 contract is the contract size. Type of delivery. Is that going to be cash settled or physical settled? So it can be settled in cash or physical. Why? Because uh, let's take an example of the gold again. So I went into a contract that 50,000 per 10 gram will be the gold price. And I want to buy from someone. So the counterparty B, let's say uh, the person counterparty B. So counterparty B is obliged to sell the gold to me 
at 50,000 for 10 gram. That's the fixed rate. And for one kg, it will be like 5 million INR. Okay. 90 days from now, because the price and all the details are fixed, dates are fixed. Now we need to look at what would be the price 90 days from now. And market says that gold is now selling at six million dollar, six million INR per kg. So 90 days later, it has become 60 million INR. To clean it up a little bit. So essentially, I'm happy because market is selling the gold at 6 million rupees per kilogram and I have the contract which allows me to buy at a lower price of 5 million only as opposed to higher price in the market which is 6 million. So here I'm making a gain. One million INR, which is six minus five million. Okay. It can be settled in two ways. One, I might just pay five million and ask the counterparty B to deliver one kg of gold at my home. That will be called physical settlement. Physical settlement because I'm getting the physical quantity of gold, which can be touched, that is tangible, I can carry in the bag. So that is physical settlement. In case of bushel, I might expect uh, maybe a couple of trucks of weeds or the rice on my doorstep. That will be also physical settlement. However, the cash settlement is different when I would just ask my counterparty B saying that, hey, uh, you don't need to come all the way and deliver the gold at my doorstep. You can just transfer the difference amount. What is the difference amount? How much money I'm making right now because of the future contract? That is 1 million INR. That 1 million INR can be just transferred to my bank account in, in a pure cash form. Well, of course, nowadays uh, it can be even sent uh, with the Bitcoin, of course, and I, I don't, know, don't mind. But if the cash or the money or any uh, su such currencies are directly transferred rather than sending the physical delivery, that is called cash settled. And when I'm saying digital currency or any cryptocurrency, uh, that means cash settled anyway, right? Even if someone comes and give me the cash only, that is also cash settled. So that is the two way the delivery can happen. So that is a type of delivery. Then there's a tick size. So tick size is considered when um, there's a small movement. So generally exchange talks about the small delta uh, movement up or down in the contract price. So that is called tick. So for example, uh, one, one gold, uh, one 10 gram of gold can move up or down by say one cent. One cent. So one cent will be the tick size here. And if I have 10 gram of gold and the movement is there basically for entire 10 gram gold only, then the tick size will be 0.1. So because that's 0 0.01 times 10 gram, it becomes 0 0.01. So the unit of the movement, like the movement of one cent or one pence or um, any such interest rate, that one unit of the movement is called one tick. And we'll, we'll observe uh, how it works in subsequent example as well. Initial and maintenance margin. That, that's another area that we'll discuss in more detail. However, just to introduce the concept here, Initial margin is when the broker or the exchange will allow a trader, will allow the trader to borrow money from the broker and 
buy the stock. So for example, I want to buy 100 stocks of Tesla. And Tesla is trading, uh, trading at um, maybe $590 right now, $590. Let's, say, let's make it 600 just for the ease of calculation. Oops. So it's trading at say 600. It has slightly gone down in the last few days, but it is picking up again. So $600. So essentially I need in total 100 times 600. So all together $60,000. That's what I need to buy that many shares. However, I check the bank account and I do not have more than $30,000. So broker will ask me to deposit 50% of traded value. So 50% of that, which is 30K, I can deposit and remaining 30K will be financed by the broker. And this 30K is called initial margin because broker needs some safety as well. And ultimately all the stock that is purchased that will remain with the broker account anyway. So broker has ultimately the hold on the um, uh, stocks that I'm buying. And on the same time, it also has some initial deposit from my end, which is called initial margin. And after the purchase of this, when the price moves up or down, if I need to um, deposit more dollar and money with the broker account because of the um, requirement to have at least the 30% of the 30% uh, uh, value of the entire portfolio. And if I fall below 30%, then broker will call me and ask the, hey, Nidhish, um, you have gone below the uh, maintenance margin. So you need to deposit this many thousand dollars. And that will be called maintenance margin. And to keep that maintained, I will get the margin call from the broker and the broker will ask me to deposit some more cash, which will be, or even some other uh, security or uh, instruments as a guarantee, and that will be called maintenance margin. So that is the concept of underlying asset, delivery date, specific prices, contract size, etc. So this graph explains us how the profits or losses are made in future. We have seen plenty of examples so far in the discussion. Uh, let's uh, put that graphically, how it works. So imagine a contract price, which is signed at, a contract which is signed at this price. And price starts to go up. Just like we saw the example of farmer and the crop. If the price is signed at, uh, the farmer is supposed to sell at $10 and price start to go up, maybe 11, then 12 and 13. What will happen to farmer? Farmer will be at loss. So that will be the situation, this situation. So whenever the farmer is along uh, is on a short position and the price is rising. So in this example, if the price start to move, we are here at 10, if it goes to 11 and then 12 and 13, here is a loss. This part reflects the loss to the short seller, which is the farmer here. However, the buyer, the cereal maker, the biscuit maker, they are sitting at this side and they're making gain. Whatever the loss farmer is making, the same extent, the gain, the long position is making, which is the cereal maker. So each unit of the movement upward in the price is causing loss to the farmer and gain to the 
industry or the business. So long will gain and short will lose. Now, opposite situation. I want to buy gold at 50K and the gold price is rising. So gold price is riding, rising from 50 to 60 to 70, etc. like this, which is explained here. So price, let's say is 50K. Now, as the gold price is rising at each unit, maybe 60, 70, 80, I'm making gain and my, my counterparty, which was a short seller, is making the equal amount of loss. So that's what the two graph explains. So the long position will look like this and the short position will look like this graphically. This is their portfolio gain and loss. And you can see easily that it is a zero sum game because ultimately at any point, the sum of the both party gain and loss is zero. So this is how we can understand this graphically as well. Now we come to another very interesting side, how the contract look like on the market data providers. Uh, one of the leading one is Bloomberg. So we can get this data easily from the Bloomberg terminal using some commands and a typical future contract looks like this. Now we will go stepwise to understand where is the price, the tick size, the date expiration, um, and uh, overall, uh, uh, speculator uh, margins and the gain and losses, we can fetch all these details from the Bloomberg screenshot. And we'll understand this one by one. So the first thing is the delivery date, the maturity date, expiry date, which is here. So delivery date can be found here, Feb 20. And that is also expir expiration date where all both the parties will either physically or in a cash settle their loss and gains. So important aspect, which we can find here, delivery date. Next one is contact size. So in earlier example, we noticed that if I want to buy one kg of gold and the, the, the price quoted is per 10 gram, I need at least 100 contracts. So the size of contract is required in the multiples to fulfill the requirement. If we want to hedge, we also need to have the, the um, certain, certain material amount of the contract size in order to hedge ourselves. And that's why the contract size is important. We might not be able to solve our purpose, with one or two contracts, so that is important. So here it is 100 croy ounce. That's a contract size. Tick size, we talked about the one unit of movement. So the contract here, the exchange shows the movement in the 0.1 unit. So it will not, it will not reflect that, okay, the price has gone up by 0.1113, say, so it will not reflect that price has gone up by 0.12 or 0.13. No, it will only show the movement in 0.1 units. So either it will be 0 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3. So this is how the tick works. And th this movement will be used to also calculate margin because this will reflect the gain and losses on the contract. So this tick size is important part of the future agreement and we can fetch it from Bloomberg contract, Bloomberg screen. And finally, the price. Re really uh, the most uh, uh, critical component of this agreement. Margin requirements now uh, for 
speculator and hedger, there is a slight difference between the margin requirement and also we have to note initial and secondary mar margin. So the secondary margin is when we have to maintain the margin amount after the long position. So once we have gone into the transactions and the market start to move, we also have to maintain the margin and secondary margin is the same number. So this is how we can fetch all the required numbers of the future contract from a screenshot of the Bloomberg. So these are very uh, useful applications. Uh, on, uh, everyone should learn, those who are working on the future contracts or valuation pricing of the derivatives. So Bloomberg is a very, very important and indispensable tool in the industry. And we come to our favorite word, terminologies of the day, margin requirements and exchange. So who takes care of that margin? Who mandates the margin requirement? So it, it, it is part and parcel of the um, exchange requirement as well. So the major difference between the future and forward, which is highlighted in the bold, is margin requirement, daily settlement, and exchanges, etc. So here, exchange plays the role and it requires a deposit of margin and this margin account is regularly debited or credited based on the spot price of the underlying asset. So uh, to simplify what, what the underlying asset is, here it could be gold. That could be the underlying asset and the price movement since we have logged the price at 50K and in case I'm a long position. I have bought gold and the gold price is going down. So essentially the entire value of the portfolio is lower now and I'll be required to deposit more cash or any such collateral to protect the margin account or the broker basically. So in this case, the calculation takes place based on the spot prices. Spot price means the, the, that days or that time's uh, price, the prevailing price of gold in the market. So that's, that calculation takes place at the spot price for the underlying asset and we calculate the margin. Now the margin call, as, as we discussed earlier, if uh, our account with the broker is falling short of cash or the positions uh, as a security, then I will get a margin call to deposit more money. Or maybe I can put some more, uh, some other securities as well. It is just to guarantee um, the broker that there will be no default. So that's why the margin call is required. So if the margin account of the buyer or seller falls below a certain point, known as the minimum required margin or secondary margin, a margin call will happen. So that's, that's what we discussed earlier. So how it works. So margin requirement and exchange. So basically if the delivery date is three days from now and future price is 50,000 USD per barrel, contract size is 1,000 per 1,000 barrels, tick size is 0 0.01 and tick value is $10. We have initial margin of $5,000. How, how is, it, is this calculated? So we need to look at contract size and the future price first. So 50 times 1000. And since the tick size is 0.01, a number of contract is 10, we can take 10% of the entire entire amount as the initial margin. So generally the initial margin is calculated at the 10%. So we take 10% of this as initial margin. 
However, uh, to bear in mind that with time, the market movement can reduce the overall value of the portfolio. And if the value of the portfolio is reduced, in that case, the margin may fall below the maintenance margin level. So after the market movement, say 5,000 deposit that I had made in the account, and because of the market movement, I lost say $3,000, okay? So how much cash is still there? 3,000, so 5,000 minus 3,000, I have still 2,000 worth of cash in the account. The maintenance margin is 3,000, which is 30% of the total borrowed money. So, <clears throat> Sorry, 3% of the total borrowed money. So if my maintenance margin is 3,000 and my cash in the account is only 2,000, I have to deposit another 1,000 in order to reach and maintain the margin level at 3,000. And since I had deposited another 1,000, I will get a call from the broker as a maintenance call or margin call. And that's how it, that's how it works. If I'm making loss, my margin deposit, which is the initial margin, may go down. And if it, 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 if it goes down below the maintenance margin, only then I'll get a margin call. So imagine the loss was such that I moved from 5,000 to 3,000, I will still not get the margin call. Until it becomes 2999, then I'll start to get the haunting calls from the brokers. Though I don't mind getting the calls anyway, uh, just that when it is for the margin call, yeah, you'll think, okay, we have to deposit more money or some securities to safeguard or assure the broker that their uh, value and the assets are protected. Now, this is a little more interesting example, some more calculations. So generally uh, the exposure is calculated as the price per contract number of con times number of contracts times the total units within one contract so for example 10 is the number of contract 10 is the number of contract units within one contract is 1000 and this is the price as we can expect so all together Units of con um, units within one contract times the number of contracts times the price it becomes five hundred thousand. Now with with this we can clearly see the ten percent, right? That's what we uh, have seen in the past. Ten percent is the initial margin, so that becomes fifty thousand. Ten percent of five hundred thousand. What will be the maintenance margin? We have seen in the initial example, it was 3%. So that becomes 30K here. So in this case, we can easily find out so maintenance margin is here in this case, 6%, so not 3%. So it is 30,000 maintenance margin. So the entire worth of portfolio should not go below 30,000. And if the loss is made by the long position holder, such that the, there is a more than $20,000 worth of loss, then there'll be a margin call because then the, the cash deposited will be below 30K. How do we calculate this? Okay, so the tick value also given here. So as, as we have uh, noted earlier, the tick size is generally 0 0.01 dollar. For the bond, there's a different tick size, but um, for the barrel or the bushel, the tick size is generally 0 0.01. Now, tick value is 
again tick size multiplied by the number of contracts and unit within one contract so again 1000 which is coming from here number uh, number of contracts and the tick size so that thus we get tick value so tick value is really the number of units all together times the contract times the tick size tick size so how do we calculate all, all these numbers so settlement price after we go into the contract at this let me just clean it up so after going into the contract as per these statistics next day day 1 the there is a movement in the market from 50 it becomes 51.1 per barrel which means the margin will be impacted so uh, the margin account which was deposited remains 50000 only tick movement is 110 how because the movement is 1.1 because it has gone up from 50 to 51.1 so 1.1 times 10 times 1000 and 0 0.01 so it arrives at 110 so this is how we calculate tick movement change to margin account that will be 11000 change to margin account because we have again got 1.1 dollar movement per barrel as per this and number of contracts times the unit each in each contract is 10000 and how do we get 10000 this times this so the total barrel and number of contract we multiply that that is 10000 and we know the movement on that day is 1.1 so 1.1 times 10000 is 11000 altogether so that is my change to margin account on daily basis now this is a positive movement because the worth of the asset and the security has gone up rather than making loss it is opposite movement so that 11000 will be added to my beginning margin account and that becomes 50000 plus 11000 it becomes 61 so again to right here 50 plus 11k that is 61k because if it was a loss say minus 11k then my margin account would have been 50 minus 11 49 this is how we calculate the margin accounts fast forward all other numbers are similar net gain and loss on the day is 11000 that we know and the uh, the second day day 2 there is a opposite movement now the price has gone down 47.5 so there is a loss of some 3.6 dollar per barrel so 3.6 dollar per barrel which means as per the uh, in terms of the tick movement it would become 3.6 times 10000 times the tick that becomes 300 60. So 360 that comes to here. Now the negative sign because it is a loss. It is a downward tick. And that's why the tick is important. So 360 is negative because it's a downward movement in the tick. And change in the margin account in this case would be just uh, uh, 100 contracts. Because what we do, we just take 10% impact into this. So 360 times 100, that becomes 36,000 of the change in the margin account. Now, if we have 36,000 change, that is for that day. We are calculating the margin account and the changes for that particular day, which is 36,000. So that 36,000 will be adjusted to 61,000, which is opening, right? Uh, that's what we ended with. So 61,000 was my total margin call the day before. 
So this becomes my opening margin account and 36,000 is adjusted. So let me just clear it out a little. So here, 61,000, which was an opening margin account is adjusted with 36,000 and we get finally 25,000 of total margin balance now. Right. There's another way to calculate this as well. So let's see another way. So 25,000 is my margin balance. Okay. What is the loss? I have made 47.5. So what is the loss since I went into the contract? The contract was signed at $50. Now it is 47.5. So what is the delta? What is the difference? $2.5 per barrel. So $2.5 per barrel times 10, which is the number of contract, times 1,000 becomes 25,000. So 25,000 is what? That is our, that is the loss on that, that, on that particular day. 25,000 is the loss on that particular day. Then why we have is still a positive sign? That is because that loss of 25,000 will be adjusted to our initial balance of margin, 50K. So 50K minus 25K is only 25,000 of balance. Only 25,000 of the margin is left in the account here. Now there is a big problem with this because if 25,000 of margin is only left in the account, we have breached something. Maintenance margin 30K. Are we above maintenance margin or below? We are below maintenance margin. So there would be a margin call of 5K. That's why at 25K, we'll receive a margin call. So this is how the account rolls in the margin, initial margin, maintenance margin, margin um, calls. And next day it can again go up from 47.50, it can go up to 50.20. We know initial margin was 50,000. And now we have made a gain because here the value has gone up by 2.5 seven dollar 2.7 dollar per barrel and if we multiply this with 100 we get 270 dollar which is the tick movement now the question is that why tick movement is multiplied by 100 that is because we have 1000 contract, uh, unit per contract, 10,000 is the number of contracts and the tick movement is 0 0.01. That means for each one unit of movement in the tick, there'll be impact of $100. For one cent of the movement in the tick, there'll be impact of $100. If we have the impact of 2.7, Right. If we have the impact of 2.7, we have essentially impact of 270. That is why we are calculating the tick as 100 times of the movement on daily basis. So this is 270 and change to margin account is just 270 times 10,000 because that's the time times of unit and contract and so on and forth, we get all this number. So this is the basics of margin, in, margin, in, initial margin, maintenance margin, and margin calls. And on day-to-day -day basis, we can calculate this. Now the question comes that, 
how the future contracts are valued and how they are priced. Since all the different instruments, equity bonds uh, or the real estate, uh, building, property, plant and equipment, they all have their very unique way of pricing. So is the case for future as well. So future pricing, there are two ways of calculating the future price. Uh, one is buying the commodity or maybe the oil barrels or the gold and keep it in the store. So if we need to value the future, we can take two approaches. One, if I want to know, okay, so how much gold would be 90 days from now? There is one way to buy the gold of that amount by taking a loan. So if I want to have one kg of gold 90 days from now, I will take a loan cash and buy one kg of gold from the goldsmith or any shop, put that in the locker. So I have to pay interest on the loan. Of course, I have to pay loan as well. I, I can't run away uh, with that money. Um, so I have to pay the loan principal. I have to pay interest. So interest is the charge additional expense. And I also, also have to pay for the storage, be it the locker or maybe, maybe cold storage, whatever, wherever I store the commodity or anything, I have to pay for the storage. And also there's an adju um, adjustment basically for the any income I generate. Generally for the gold or bushel will not get any carry return, but in case we receive um, any carry or maybe any dividend if we are keeping the uh, shares, that is called carry return. In most of the cases, we, that is zero. So when we add all this number, we can find out that how much cost it incurs to hold the gold for 90 days, because that's one way also to fix the price of gold, just to buy the gold and keep it in the stock. And that's what we try to obtain by going into the future. So if we look at the total expenditure of buying the gold, paying the interest, storage, etc., and how much cost it takes to do all these activities, that can be a, a great way to calculate future price. And the other way is buy the future contract in, in, in the market. And in that case, we will find out that prevailing price of the future is X dollar. So ideally, these two prices should be the same because if the prevailing market price in, in uh, of future in the market in the market x is higher if the prevailing price x is higher then how much it cost me to buy the gold and keep it in the store then what will happen is people people will start to get the arbitrage benefit arbitrage benefit uh, profit is when um, same commodity or the same stock have two different price in two different markets so what one will do? Everyone will try to sell the expensive uh, in the expensive market and buy in the uh, cheaper market. And in between, one can earn the arbitrage. So that is the concept of arbitrage. And we can apply it wherever we find that uh, same commodity or the same stock or the financial instrument has two different prices in two different exchanges or location, there is an arbitrage opportunity. So how we... Um, use that in the future and when it comes to the future pricing. If we see that future contract in the market is trading at a higher price, if the future contract in the market is at the higher price, we will sell a future contract and buy as per strategy one, which is buy now and hold. So buying as per this strategy means buy the gold, keep in the stock, pay the interest, pay the storage charges or the locker uh, fees to the bank and also write a future contract, go short in the future contract and say that, okay, I'm going to sell the gold at the higher price. In between, there will be a delta 
which can be the arbitrage profit arbitrage profit we'll understand that with one example now so if there is a spot price at the rate of 20 barrel oops if the spot price is 50 dollar per barrel and the cost of borrowing is just 5% okay the cost of storing 1000 barrel of oil is 2000 etc etc so we can calculate the buy and buy now and hold strategy so what is the spot price that is 50 dollar and number of contracts here so 1000 so essentially we have 50000 of the price next carry cost the carry cost is literally the cost of keeping the store storage or um, keeping the, uh, something in the store room so in this case it will be interest as well because ultimately when we buy that we have to bear the cost of interest we have to pay to the bank the interest so that will be allocated to the future price so interest and the storage so let's see how much is the interest the cost of borrowing is five percent all right so five percent of the total price to borrow so 50 50 times 1000 is the total dollar investment and times five percent here that is the interest rate and barrel of oil cost of storing 1000 barrels of oil is 2000 okay so this is my cost of storage of course oil takes a lot of space so unless we have electric cars which is coming soon hopefully elon musk is working hard on this so we might not have this case study in future classes so two thousand dollar. So all together, two thousand plus two thousand five hundred and fifty thousand. That becomes fifty four thousand five hundred. If we borrow the money from the bank, pay the interest, store it in the storeroom, and pay the charges, ultimately it will cost us fifty four thousand five hundred. For the same period but if we go to the market and say that okay what is the future price we get a quote of fifty-five thousand. now you can see clearly the market is overpriced so one of the rule of thumb that we follow we follow in investment business investment market and that's something i i can tell you on the basis of uh, different financial studies and uh, business experience that we try to sell what is high in the market so if you have two prices, basically, one high and another one low, how would you play arbitrage? Sell the high one, sell the higher price, take the short position in the higher price and take a long position in the lower price. So buy low, sell high. That's what we'll do here. Sell high, this is a higher price, high, and buy lower price. So this is a lower price. It's lower by $500 as compared to this price. So buy the lower price one and sell the higher price one. And then we'll see how we can make the profit in more details. Let's see. So essentially, yeah, see here. Sell a future contract at fifty-five thousand. So we have to sell the contract. Basically, in order to sell something, you need to have it in, in, in your store or in your position. You can't sell without having it. So how can you have it? And for that, we already have noticed that buying and storing is cheaper. So what we'll do? We'll borrow. We know it. It costed fifty thousand dollar because the price is fifty and there is a one thousand barrel. So fifty thousand is the borrowing since the um, uh, and 1000 barrel of oil at the spot price can be bought 
at 50,000. 50, so we got this money from bank, 50,000. And then we use the same money to buy 1,000 barrels of oil. Essentially, we also have to pay interest. Interest at the rate of 5%. So that becomes 4,500. Sell a future contract for 1,000 barrels. So we know this one from here. Selling a future contract cost um, actually gives me income of 55,000. So I will sell the future contract. And when the time comes, I will generate that money. So let's say 55,000 is the income. Now I have to repay the loan as well. So then 55,000 is subtracted. So basically what are the cash outflow here? 50,000, first cash outflow. Second is interest for the period of borrowing times the interest rate times the borrowing amount. So that is 4,500. And third thing, which is a cash outflow is a payment to buy the oil. So 50,000. 50, so all this money is a cash outflow. Outflow, outflow and outflow. Now this is inflow and this one is also inflow. So all together, we got $500 extra because future contract is more expensive than uh, buying and holding. And that's where we can make the, in this manner, we can make a gain of $500. So basically borrow the money from the bank, pay the interest, pay the storage charges and sell a contract. After th uh, 30 days or 90 days or six months, when the contract will settle, the contract will give you more money then it has costed you to buy a bushel oil, etc., and keeping in the storage and paying the interest. So this is how the arbitrage profits are made in the context of future contracts. So essentially, future is very, very liquid and is structured or uh, exchange traded for, um, uh, financial product and instrument. Uh, though, of course, um, future is also not, uh, should not be used for speculation or at least uh, should not be just randomly used because as Warren Buffett said, and many uh, fin financial researcher or uh, investor have said that um, misuse of derivatives can be disastrous. It is considered the financial weapon of mass destruction. So derivatives should be used uh, very judiciously and uh, it should it should be the part of the risk management process but um, only after the right data and the calculation and with the proper strategy it should be used so thank you so much for watching this video and for more such videos and the discussion on the financial topics capital market equity shares and even the financial management topics audit anything um, relating to the investment and financial market you can keep visiting the channel, subscribe and like the channel and let us, uh, let us know if you have any query and question on this topic or if you'd like any particular topic to be covered on FinSepin channel, please feel free to drop a message on the, in the comment and we'll make one for you. Thank you so much for watching.